Hello and welcome to season two of Refocus, where we talk to artists and music industry professionals about building sustainable careers as creative workers with a focus on folk. I'm your host, Rosalind Dennett. Hello and welcome to Refocus. Today our guest is the Juno-nominated multi-instrumentalist, producer, and singer-songwriter Asa Nabi. He's OG Cree Sucker Clan of the Sandy Lake First Nations, a remote flying community in the far reaches of northwestern Ontario, and is currently based in Toronto. His debut album, Waten, named after his grandfather, includes 10 tracks and nine interludes featuring the voice of his grandfather and is both part music and journalism, artistry, and expression. His new EP, Here and Now, was released in October 2023 and is available everywhere. Asen Abbey is the winner of three 2023 Summer Solstice Indigenous Music Awards, winner of the 2023 Jim Beam Indie Award for Indigenous Artist of the Year, winner of a 2023 Canadian Live Music Award for New Touring Artist of the Year, and the winner of the 2023 Ontario Folk Music Awards for Recording Artist of the Year. Here's our conversation with Asen Abbey. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. I feel like it's been a while since I've seen you. We managed to intersect at a bunch of, I would say, like industry events. You know, one of the first times I met you was at FMO last year, where I can confidently say that you were a runaway hit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, made a big, big impression on a lot of folks there and have just kind of continued on this amazing trajectory. How has this last little bit been? Yeah, no, it's, it's been incredible. And yeah, yeah, that, that was a really cool space. Like, I want to start off by saying, I wish people told me about these music conferences like ages ago, you know, like, because I feel like obviously like maybe it wouldn't have happened the way that it happened because like you know i had like the label and like people who had been in the industry were like on my team who had been in the industry for like decades so like that really helped but like yeah i remember just like trying to set up shows in bars and then just like hoping someone would walk through the door and then like voila my music career it's happening (laughs) and you know but that like that just never happened and it's like you play these music conferences and then suddenly you're playing to a room like full of these people that you would hope would come to that bar gig except you're like yeah the people who book festivals and the booking agents and the people who own venues and the people who have have just been in the music scene and and i don't know just all these crazy connections that you make at these conferences i I don't know why i never thought to go to them before but seven more your first industry conference or had you gone to some before that well, I guess technically my first one would have been Canadian Music Week, like pre-pandemic, but like I still didn't quite know, right? Like, and it's kind of like South by Southwest on a smaller scale, but still like just as like hard to meet people because there'll be like thousands of musicians across the city and like every single venue is throwing on an event. And then there's only so much music industry people, right? So I think my first one where I actually got like some FaceTime with people was like Mundial Montreal, mm. like I think 2021. And like places were still kind of really in the pandemic mode. So it's like, I got a gig actually this past summer from Mundial, like 2021, November. It almost took like almost two years for something to come of it. But like, that's how I ended up going to Denmark and going to the Tonder Music Festival was by playing that music conferences like nearly two years ago. It's a long game, you know? Exactly. And it's just like, you make all these connections and like, and, and network and stuff. But some of them are, are pretty big too. Like, I mean, the International Folk Alliance one was like kind of crazy as well. I think I could have like maybe organized my day is a little bit better to maybe go to more of those panels. I mean, it was my first time being there. I remember just being kind of like, wow, this is insane because it was like three levels of hotel and then everyone's like up till like six in the morning. <laughs> was- yeah, at some point you do have to sleep. If you could like divide yourself in half, that would be really effective because it's pretty hard to play music and stay up super late and then be up bright eyed and bushy tailed for meetings the next day. Yeah, I think I just got really excited to be there and just see something so wild and weird and new. And I loved it. It was just so cool. It was just it felt like that movie, like almost famous where they're like walking around like crazy hotel, or whatever. But like it was, yeah, it was really cool to kind of just every floor and there's like different music happening in every room and there's thousands of musicians and, and music industry people. And it just seems like you're at like one of the coolest parties ever. I don't know. <laughs> it was hard to like 
reel that in a bit. Well, maybe let's let's take a little step back to like, what were you doing over the pandemic time? And, and before that, what was that time like for you? Yeah, like before music conferences, before I guess my music career started becoming a career, I was still playing music. I was just kind of doing it in my spare time. I moved to Toronto to play music, but then I ended up going to school for journalism and then I worked in journalism. I mean, it's tough to be creative after like a day of news. I don't know, like some people like they'll watch the news for an hour and be like, I am so drained. And like that feeling doesn't change when you work in the news for eight hours. Like I I, I was just coming out of there being like, oh, I just want to like watch Netflix and turn off my brain because like the world is on fire. So like I would still like set up shows and play and keep my like, practice when I had energy and stuff. So like, I mean, it wasn't like this music career kind of came out of nowhere and I just like learned how to play guitar during the pandemic. Like I'd been playing for a minute. Yeah. Like I remember January, 2020 and like playing a show with a band and being like, this is going to be the year. And then like everything shut down. And then, so I think like I'd gotten this job in journalism and I'd gotten this career in journalism. And like, I was like a unionized salaried journalist in this country, which is nearly impossible to get. And me being like the first person in my family, like, or like one of the first people in my family to like graduate post-secondary and get a career and and being paying into a pension and stuff like that. It was kind of like, it was with that. And then with the world shutting down and not being able to play music to people anymore, I was kind of like, okay, well maybe I can just like, I could just be a journalist and and do music on the side. Cause yeah, like at that time, like I just never didn't know how to like kind of get into the music industry and get in there and get involved. Like I just play shows and hope for the best. But flip then, because it's not like you were in a career you were maybe desperate to get out of. It was kind of just a weird collection of incidences and or not, like a weird things that just organically happened. So when that realization came, when the world shut down and it wasn't the year and I was just like, okay, well, I'm, I'm still going to make music. I'm never not going to like not make music. It's so wild to me that when you have like these big artists who are just, I'm retiring music. I'm just like, how? Because it's just something I I just genuinely love to do. And so, yeah, like I was just like, all right, well, now that there isn't this pressure to like make it, I was just like, I'm just going to like work on music that I want to work on. And, and so, yeah, like there was with that kind of mindset. And then kind of the whole story with my grandfather, of him moving into long-term care in 2020. And then that leading to me to, to interview him for a year. So it kind of like changed my perspective on how I was making music. Like I wasn't trying to like make a, like a product or anything. I was trying to like make something kind of special to me and my family. And so like, I think that translated quite a bit. And I was like, just kind of working on this album. Cause like I started working on this album, like probably the end of 2020 is when I like decided mm-hmm. I was going to start writing songs about it. I just like spent the first little bit kind of just plugging away. And because like, we were all like locked down in our houses, I suddenly had, to, I wouldn't say I had the time where I didn't have the time before I just like all the things that would eat up your time before the pandemic like going out with friends and stuff (laughs) like having a social life all that went away so suddenly you had this time and like I don't know it was a weird time too because so many of my friends got laid off and then they got the serb and they're just like yeah I'm just I'm just at home making music the whole time and I'm like I was working from home so I was working remotely so I'd still like I was like doing COVID updates every day and stuff like that. So I was still drained and I was still like, oh, I'm sc- okay, well, I'll just work on this album like over the however long it's going to take to kind of work on it. That's where I met Shoshona and Amanda early 2021 doing like their virtual version of the International Indigenous Music Summit. I mean, that was all just by kind of chance as well. Like it was like early spring maybe and they they are doing virtual sessions. And there was Indigenous people from across the country who just kind of told our story and like, made a little mini doc and that's where they kind of saw me and they're just kind of like, who are you? And what are you doing? What are you working on right now? And then I told them about this album and I was like, it's not done though. Like I have like two demos and some ideas and I'm there starting a record label and they decided to like sign me. They said they wanted me to be their first signing based on like this idea I had for this, this album and like one performance video I'd done for their mini documentary. And yeah, I mean, that's amazing. Just to reiterate there. So you were the first artist signed to Ishkade Records. That's such an interesting relationship to me because that must have been like a bit of a leap of faith on your part too, right? It really was. I mean, I didn't really know 
anything about the music industry and I was like Googling stuff, right? Like that's, that's, that's thankfully I had a, like enough training as a journalist, maybe to, to kind of just be able to kind of gather research more efficiently. But like, I don't know. I was, I was, I was always kind of put at calm with the way that like Amanda and Shoshona talked about things and like how they just pass you information and stuff like that. And how everything they say, they kind of say with care and it didn't quite feel like, you know, the classic business person in a suit being like, sign your art to me and give it to me, please. And I'm going to exploit it. <laughs> they just have this like very kind of like, you know, I don't want to use the word holistic because even that word, that but they had like a very kind of like just human way of, of saying, you know, we're starting this business. We hate to call it a business, but you know, it, it is a business. This is our beliefs and this is kind of our mission statement. We want to like uplift indigenous voices and like, you know, the story you're trying to tell is the exact stories we, we want to kind of uplift. And one thing I want to point out too is like they signed me with two down like I had two songs we remastered and sent back out. But like it's not normal for record labels to sign people who don't really have anything <laughs> on the internet or anything. Like people will normally sign people when they have a million things on TikTok or billions of streams on so, uh, whatever platform if they have like so many followers on social media like record labels don't mostly sign people when they they've already done all the work mm-hmm. and they can kind of use that so to kind of like find someone who's not really known and to kind of be like we want to like bring you up like is i don't think is very common no oh, and like it seems like a neat relationship because you basically were able to kind of grow together at the same time that they were building the label. Did you feel like you were being developed or was there like a, did it feel like a different trajectory once you got signed? I don't know. They kind of just really gave me space to kind of basically have kind of control in every, almost every aspect. So like control, creative control, control of how I play shows, control. Like if there was something I wanted, like I feel like I was able to ask and then Mm. we were able to kind of like, figure it out but yeah i didn't really feel like i was like a and r to, to become a different person or anything like that which i know happens pretty like, frequently we were just kind of growing together and yeah i don't think any of us like really saw the trajectory kind of going to where it went to like so quickly like, maybe we thought it would have taken a while longer i know at, at one point there was talks about like not putting out the album when we did like putting it out on november 4th of last year was actually like an intentional decision hmm. even though like it was all thing of us like oh like well there's like marketing and stuff that happens behind a new record right and we had like mm-hmm. no time we I mean, like finished the record and it was like well let's just put it out immediately <laughs> that's like this is and it was intentional because like it's gonna sound weird but like that was the last day that you could put a record out for it to be considered for a Juno and I remember just the weirdest it wasn't even like what's much smaller than the word argument it was like such a it was like a discussion of just like I think show was just like oh, I'm not sure if I want to put you through that whole like Juno circuit just at this time in your career and stuff and I was just like oh, I don't know and it was just like funny back and forth of just like bring me back a year and I don't I don't think I would be having this conversation at all of like we should try and see if we can get a Juno <laughs> and it was such a weird thing it was weird to talk about too just because of the context of the album right mm-hmm. and like for those listening who, who haven't listened to the album like it's a story the story of my grandfather Watton that the album's named after him and all the songs are based off of like these stories that he told me like during the year of 2020 and like there's like a clip of a conversation and then like a song inspired by that and, you know, it, it focuses on his life, which includes, you know, stories of, of him meeting my grandmother, but then like stories of them being in, in residential school. So it's always such an icky feeling, I guess, when, you, when you're when you talking about awards <laughs> and stuff like that, when it's like such like a deeply personal and kind of like really heavy conversation and topic of a record. Well, and, like I think that this isn't acknowledged very often for artists i've been through this i've lost tons of awards but like sometimes like if you also don't get an award like this it's a roller coaster and i know that like you have won awards and and you've been nominated but when it's for something that's so deeply personal do those feelings get mixed up where you're like does it sting if you're like this is something that means so much to me you know oh i think it's stung a little bit but for for a very different reason like I went into there thinking like I wasn't going to win, but just the fact to 
so the whole reason we were, we were talking about like whether or not it should go and be considered for a Juno, like I wasn't really thinking about winning the Juno. I was just thinking about like all these people I saw like Juno nominated on their bios and stuff. And then Juno nominated when they're like being pitched to festivals and when they're this or that, right? Like it carries a certain weight as part of your career. Like suddenly you're, what you're getting paid to play the festivals, that rate go up. And it's not even like suddenly because touring and playing is so expensive and when I was doing it solo, it's like really easy, right? But then suddenly when you when you have a seven piece band and you're flying everybody on your own dollar and then you're like paying everybody and feeding everybody and, and, and all the all the stuff attached with touring and, and even getting merch made and all that, like there's all these crazy expenses that it's like hard for people to, to just break even. But then if you can start making more money, then like you can actually start developing a show and like being like, ooh, like I always thought it'd be cool to have, you know, these lights or I mean, I want to have a hundred foot hologram that walks through the audience. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's so many cool things that would be so amazing to like be able to kind of like create like a really immersive show or a show that just, you get to like help them bring them that space that, that you were in when you were making the song and stuff and making it like so much more special and so much more like ingrained in people's memories. And so, yeah, like that was, that was like kind of the reasoning behind that. It was just like, this would just kind of really help build up shows and stuff like that. Um, the performance that you did at the Junos was <laughs> just like, I mean, that was a show that was so incredible and impressive. What was it like to, to get to put together that performance? Oh man, it was so incredible. Cause honestly the whole insight team, like from the Junos, like production team was like, they were so incredible to work with. Like I can't give them enough props because like I was, I was like touring I think my birthday, January 25th, was when like we went to the Juno's office or the Insight office, and then we started. They're like, "You're gonna play, be playing the Juno's, so like, what do you want to do?" And we had like one meeting, and then I went on tour, and then like I was doing like a tour out west solo tour, and then like so I was on these phone calls with the team and being like, "Ooh, what about this? And what about that?" And they were so incredible, and they're so receptive to everything. The only thing that got turned down. Uh, which got turned down basically immediately it was like, I was like, what, what if we got a hologram? <laughs> the hundred foot hologram. <laughs> and, and there's just like, there's going to be no budget after that. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Can't wait for you to get your hologram show one day. <laughs> it's going to happen. But now I don't even know if I want to do it. Did you see the kiss announcement? <laughs> yeah. They're like, we think our band deserves to live on forever. It's just like, ooh. <laughs> but yeah. I was like on the phone with them and like went back and forth with emails and like I got a really great team to work with. Like Jen Sikdeo was doing tour management at the time for me and then Hill Kirkutis was like my MD for the show and Amanda was helping just all the back and forth because there was a lot of moving parts in Northern okay. Cree. Like we were able to work with Alan Graz who like manages mm -hmm. them. And like I'm just, I, I've become such good friends with Alan. Like there were, I have enough good stuff to say about him too. But even the, yeah, the whole Juno's team and like, putting together this show for just like three, it was like three, I think we got three and a half minutes, which I think was like pretty good amount of time. But then, so it was like, we played, we were here and like that, that song itself, we had to chop something out because like we were playing with Northern Cree and like we have them on the satellite stage and it was so cool. It was like, it looked even cooler than I thought it would in my mind. Because like, I remember talking to the, the Juno's team and being like, yeah, I want when they come in, like, like every time they hit the drum, like they're on that satellite stage and it lights up. So I'd love for like every time it hits, like the floor glows and pulses with every hit. And, and then they ended up just making it look so much even cooler with that idea. And it's like, it was a real like privilege to be able to like work with that team. Like, you know, I'm a musician and they're set designers and stage designers and they just absolutely perform so well at those things. So it's like, such a cool collaboration and and so one thing is like we finished playing and i remember like getting on that stage and people were like savor the moment and i totally know what they mean now because like i went up there and then it was just over like the first thing in my mind it was just like don't mess this up yeah. <laughs> and then it was over because mm -hmm. then i did the media walk so like they i went to the back and like went through all the press and the journalists and stuff and by the time i came back Nickelback was like on the last 20 seconds of their song. So like I missed the whole event, <laughs> which like, you know, it's, it's great. If journalists are sitting there and they're wanting to talk and stuff, but like part of me was like, 
man, like I know how much work I put into that show. Like I know every other artist did the exact same thing. So I can watch it on YouTube, but it's never going to be the same as being in the room and like feeling the heat from the Paijo and just like getting the bass from the subs and stuff of, of the room and, and the applause and like everything. Like there's certain things you only get from being there in, in person. But then there was like the next day. It was just, I was in the airport by myself and I just watched the video that some put on Instagram. And then there was like this point in the show, we finished the last chorus and then like Steve gets up to speak and it's just like this silence. And you just hear like an indigenous woman do like a lay, lay, lay call. And then suddenly like the, the crowd just erupts. And it was just like such an intense moment because like, I was playing through it, but I, just to kind of be able to you know watch it the second time on the, and just see that moment, it was like such an intense amount of like pride. And oh man, I just like put on my sunglasses in the Denver airport <laughs> and just wept. I was like, shit, I still got to make it all the way across this massive airport. And I was like, no, no. And I'm like trying to like squeeze through people, just like trying to like just compose myself there was not a dry eye i don't think that that saw that performance i saw that performance i was full ugly cry like it was so beautiful and intentional the music was gorgeous the whole stage production was gorgeous and the the message was really really beautiful and i'm glad that you got to see it on from both sides you know yeah exactly and like i was so honored that steve steve and that whole crew joined us and oh man i thought like, i just tell the story it was so wild because like i got there we got to the junos and we we're like a day early and then we <laughs> we went to meet up with uh steve and the crew and i just remember going up to one of the drummers that was with steve and i was like well what do you think of the song and he was just like well why don't you play it for me well i'll tell you what i think and i was like oh my god you haven't heard the song yet we we're like two days away from this show but steve and uh his son joel like they're the drum leaders and like they knew the song. So like, it's just a whole different, what they do is different than what I do. And the band does, right? Like, so like they just, they, they just follow each other and they have this whole rhythm, this whole thing that they do. And, and so, but I didn't know that. I was just like, Oh my God, you didn't hear the song. <laughs> and, um, but then like, it all just like came together. Like we, we had like a couple dry runs the day before. And yeah, it was such a crazy moment, such an incredible thing that I, I kind of, get the privilege of kind of get to have in the memory bank so yeah no kidding it doesn't seem like anything's certainly slowed down from there it seems like you've been on the road a lot has it been pretty constant yeah i mean there were some things this summer which like i remember is very specifically my agent stephanie being like i cannot believe that worked <laughs> <laughs> and this was like i bet she was just waiting to say that until that weekend was <laughs> over to be like oh my god there were some routings that was just like Sarnia, Ontario, to Cartagena, Spain, to London, Ontario, to Squamish, BC. And she asked me, like, I gave her consent for everything. I was just like, and, but this was like months prior to it actually happening where I was just like, yeah, that'll be fun. Let's do it. But then like, as time went on and like there were certain routings where I was just like, ooh, that's going to be, it's going to be a tough one. But it was so great. Well, especially since you're like early in your career, everything's exciting and like it's hard to say no to stuff when it's like you know includes an adventure yeah no exactly and so like there are times you're tired but then it's just like you know you, I, you always just have to flip the words around flip this perspective around so it's like there's sometimes where you're gonna be like uh but then you're like you know what? i don't have to do anything i get to do this so it was a pretty crazy tour and then kind of to cap it off we did like the opening slot for dan Mangan, and, and that was nice that was like just nice and cushy to be honest like because i thought i was going to be like renting a car and like driving behind him the whole time but because i was by myself and like i didn't have a sound guy i didn't have like accompaniment i didn't have anybody they had room on the bus so he's just like no like you're you're, you're part of the team so come be on the bus and and so it's like it was so nice to just like i don't think that's normal so it's such a privilege to be able to just be on the bus, not have to worry about driving to the next spot, being able to sleep and be rested for your performances. And uh, and it was like a super wholesome tour because I knew it would be too. I was like, I don't feel like Dan is going to be like pulling out a bottle of tequila at the end of the night and like staying up till four in the morning. 
and yeah, it was super chill. Like he's really like conscious of, of making sure he puts on really good performances for all of his people. So yeah, it was like such a good experience to be on that bus and see how like a performer and an artist at that level and how they go about doing their tours. And uh, Dan was just always open. Like if I had any questions, even if they're awkward questions, I've just been like, well, how much do you pay for that? <laughs> it's just like, it's like you share the knowledge, you know, yeah. it's like it's, it's, I don't know why uh, some conversations and stuff just feel awkward, but it's like all very relevant to being in the music industry. Yeah, it's shop talk, you know. I agree that I think sometimes people are pretty guarded about certain info like that, but it's not helpful. <laughs> yeah, like, I want to know. I was like, how much does this tour bus cost? Yeah. Like, how, how much money do I need to make every night to be able to be on one of these buses? It's, this thing rocks. Absolutely. Dan's such a nice guy. Seems like there was a really the Dan Mangan tour and wellness spa or something. <laughs> Speaking of like cool tours, you have one coming up soon with Allison Russell, right? Mm -hmm. It starts February 23rd and then it ends March 24th, I believe. And I think we're playing one show in Halifax during the Junos and then mm -hmm. uh, we're doing one in Lunenburg after the Junos. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. It's going to be a really, really good tour. And a bunch of youth from Sandy Lake. So I'm from like Sandy Lake First Nation. And so the chief and council wants to send like a little group of some of the youth from the community to come see our show in Winnipeg. Oh, no way. The Winnipeg like is, is the closest city to Sandy Lake mm -hmm. on the whole routing of tours that we're doing. And Sandy Lake, they have like these like charter planes, small, like maybe 14 people can fit in them that will like either just go to Winnipeg or Thunder Bay. So it's really neat that the thing would come out and kind of see a show. That's huge. Yeah, you know, it'll be good. Like, I'm not sure how they're going to, like, figure out who comes, whether they not they, like, hold some sort of contest or something. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, like, I think chances for people to come out and see new things and experience new things is good, especially in isolated communities like that, where it's easy for people to kind of feel trapped and kind of feel like the whole world is going on and then it's not taking you with it. And so, like, that leads to a lot of issues in, in places like that. Like, there's a lot of mental health issues, and, and it would be good for them to come out. And... It's a neat opportunity to get to hopefully inspire some kids, you know, and, and show a, like, a really interesting path that folks can take if they choose to, you know? Yeah. Oh, exactly. Do you think of yourself as a folk musician? I find myself just through habit falling into folk. Like, I am, like, experimenting with different sounds and... I think there's definitely little isms that every kind of artist always kind of picks up and then that starts becoming their little signature, whatever. But like, I definitely find the songs, even when I start writing them, they sound really folky. We definitely like massage songs for them to sound less folky, but I definitely find out of habit, I tend to go down a more folky singer songwriter kind of road. But it changes drastically too, even when I switch over and like just play riffs on piano instead of guitar kind of alters it a bit. I mean, I, I consider myself part folk artist for sure. Like, I like that you feel rooted in there. When you, you like think of the folk tradition as like the music of the people and the music of the land, then like is all indigenous music, the folk music of Canada in its own way of looking at it. And whatever you are doing to it and wherever you're taking it, it's just a part of that folk process of like transforming it into whatever you're imagining. You're blowing my mind right now. <laughs> I, totally, I, I didn't think of folk music as like a, a direct kind of nod to wherever it was. Like folk of Germany will sound different than folk of Australia. That's why conversations are great. You have a new EP out. Can you tell us about your new project? Yeah, yeah. Like I put out an EP on the 20th of October and it was wild to me that we even were able to put that out and I know uh, <laughs> like my PR person is like don't talk about you wish there was more songs on it but I do I wish I could have sat down and, and kind of put because we wrote a lot of songs for it but it was just like we're so busy performing and playing that it was like kind of hard to find time to record these songs but it's important to do that too because some people can make an album and they don't make an album for five years but i just me personally I, I do find it hard to kind of just go and play the same songs over and over and over again i can do it for for a certain set of time but i feel like after a while you just start becoming a different person and so you stop connecting to those songs as much because it's like you're just kind of looking at like a like a photo album or something from mm -hmm. the far past you know it's i made time to make new songs and the elevator pitch on the, the EP, it's a, it's, a, it's a breakup album, you know, but not much, I don't want to say not much has happened, but like it's, I haven't had time to like really kind of 
sit down and reflect on certain things. So yeah, I don't know. I think every album or every song I put out and write and stuff always kind of has like this kind of personal element to it. And mm. kind of like, I've always kind of from a young age process things with music and kind of augmented it with little emotions or little personal contexts. And I think that translates you know, just something that I always kind of, I always kind of personally do. Well, it was like interesting too, because I didn't know if I was going to put these songs out. Like I've written a ton of songs about it. And then I just wasn't sure how much of your life do you keep to yourself, mm -hmm. you know? And, and it's not like I'm out there writing songs that are like, oh, I, I, I hate what you left the dishes on the counter. Like there wasn't like, <laughs> there wasn't like really like specific things. So like that helps. But this person I was seeing is finishing up their breakup record. So I'm like, we're still not like on talking terms yet, but like, slowly been talking through the song well uh, weird <laughs> it is kind of interesting i'm like kind of interested to kind of sit down whenever that record starts coming out to kind of like sit with both projects and just kind of listen and be like oh like it's a very kind of interesting and, and special thing that artists and musicians i don't know you, to get like a true side a and side b of, of the same story and not to say that b or a are, like they're, they're both on equal weight but like it's like to have two sides of the same story it's like there's your merch concept right there. Get like, you know, one EP on one side of the record, one EP on the other <laughs> side. Just... Last question. I'm just wondering if you can leave folks a nugget of advice for anybody who's wondering if they should stick with it. Yeah. I mean, any helpful tips as far as the business aspect of it, like honestly, loads of things I've learned. Merch is incredible. Like it was, it was wild going on like the Dan Mangan tour and seeing how much merchandise they went through. Like I never thought so many people would want to buy a t-shirt with my name on it. You know, it's like wild how much merch, a lot of the time the merch will kind of like outpace what you're actually getting paid for the show. So make sure you're getting merch grants. I mean, work with a grant writing company. To be honest, getting like 90% of something is better than getting 100% of nothing. Mm -hmm. Like, I think they take a pretty low fee for the work that actually goes into the grants. Because like you obviously tell them all the information, like what the project's about. But then like there's this whole language in the grant world. So it's good to have somebody who speaks that language to kind of help you get your points across stronger. Sirius XM. Oh my God. Everyone get your music on Sirius XM. You don't need a million streams to get actual money that helps. There's so many channels on Sirius XM. Like, I don't know if you, we got to do to figure out this is the kind of music I make. These are the Sirius XM channels that play that kind of music. How do you get your music onto there, whether or not it's who manages those playlists? Because that really helps. I guess definitely just making sure you have time to kind of create as well. I felt like this year was really crazy busy where I kind of just like decided to like build in moments in time where I'm just like locking this off because I'm going to go into studio and work on these days. You know, it fills my cup to kind of just turn on my equipment and shout into a mic for hours on end. So maybe that doesn't work for everybody, but that self-care is important. Maybe I'm just lucky that my self-care continues to be making music, but do what you need to to fill your cup because you, otherwise you will, you will burn out. Well, that's incredible advice. You gave us like more nuggets. That was like a cup <laughs> of advice. Thank you so much. I really appreciate. I know you're you're so busy and I mean so much that you just took the time to chat with us today. Yeah, no problem. It was, it was great. Well, I hope you have a wonderful upcoming season and look forward to seeing you hopefully soon. Yeah, I look forward to it. Talk soon. That's all for this episode, friends. The Refocus podcast is brought to you by Folk Music Ontario. Find out more by heading to folkmusicontario.org slash refocus. That's R-E-F-O-L-K-U-S. The podcast is produced by Kayla Nizon and Rosalind Dennett and mixed by Jordan Moore at the Pod Cabin. The opening theme is by King Cardiac and the artwork is by Jamie Karn. Please give us a download, a like, subscribe, rate, and review to let us know you're listening. Until next time, keep it folk and have fun.